Sometimes I think What will people say of me When I'm only just a memory When I'm home where my soul belongs Was I loved But no one else would show up Was I Jesus to the least of us Was my worship more than just a song live like that can that song be said to be the actual desire of your heart now for many in the church the quick answer would be well of course pastor Jeff but I want to ask you is that truly deeply consumingly what you want do you want your life to point to Christ is this what you want more than anything else I want to ask you in continuing along with the theme that we've been in as we walk through the book of Acts, verse by verse, and as we're coming to the close and the crescendo, if you will, of the book of Acts, do you want to invest your life in Christ, his children, and his kingdom more than anything else? If you say yes, I need to ask you, are you willing to invest your life? Are you willing to put all of who you are in to what Christ has for you? Let me ask it to you this way. If you claim to be a Christian, are you willing to live for the one who died for you? Are you willing to live for, not live and acknowledge, 
but live for the one who died for you, that you could have this life? I pray that the answer is yes. I recognize that for many of us, this level of investment is uncomfortable. But I need to ask you, as God's word lays out, do you know what the call of Christ is to the church? Do you understand what it is to be a Christian? And again, I know most would say, well, of course, I've been in church my whole life. That's not what I asked. I asked, do you understand what it will cost? Jesus said you're to count the cost. This free gift of grace, do you know what it entails to be the church? Now, we're going to continue along with Paul. We're in Acts chapter 28, and I want to remind you where we've been in that you'll see this continuation, that Paul is showing us a portrait of Christ and Christ-likeness to the extent that he's living all in to do the will of God the Father, that he is living all in showing us a portrait of Christ-likeness. And let me just remind you of our context. Paul has been on three missionary journeys to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. He has found himself in Caesarea for two years plus and now has been moved to Rome. And if you've been with us, you know that was not exactly smooth sailing, right? But what we saw was that for every Christian, true biblical Christian, there must be an igniting that happens, that the Spirit of God, we saw it in Acts chapter 9 with Paul, the Spirit of God comes and indwells and takes over and makes new the believer. Amen. Now, we've been with Paul since then, and we've seen it specifically in Acts 28, and back to Acts 23 verse 11, Paul on his way to Rome, and now Paul in Rome, doing the will of God the Father. He is fully invested in the will of God. And we have seen his example investing into others. And we've noted this is the parallel, this is the portrait, this is what applies to you and me, Christian. That this is not just descriptive, this is prescriptive. This is God's plan for us. Well, in seeing this igniting of Paul, we noted that it was immediately followed by an inviting of others. And last week, we camped out on the investing that happens after the inviting. And we said, here we see again the portrait of the Christian life. You are first ignited in filled by the Spirit, and then you ignite others through your zeal and through your showing them of Christ, your salt and your light. And then you invite, we invite everybody to Christ. And then we invest in those who respond and we said that three-step process really portrays the Christian life. Ignite, invite, and invest. And last week, we camped out on the investing, and we looked at the mechanics. Well, what exactly do you mean by investing, Pastor Jeff? And praise God, as he does through his word, he gave us the answer. And we saw in chapter 28, verse 23, that one verse, an overwhelming portrait of this investing process. And we said, as is true with almost all investments, you need to look at the ROI, the return on investment in the financial world. But here we said, let's look at the ROI that comes after informing, inspecting, and inspiring. And we noted that the process or the mechanics of investing would involve receiving those who respond, acting out in obedient overtime, and then we would go through the process of informing, inspecting, and inspiring. Hence, we had a view of the supernatural, the uh, eternal investing process that we saw from Paul. Well, today we're going to shift gears. And I pray that if you've ever found yourself in this place of wondering, how in the world does this all work? How, how is it that person A and person B can share the same experience and come up with totally different outcomes? Have you ever been there? You ever been in that place where you wondered why? Perhaps you're a Christian and you say, why me? I had, I had friends and family and people I knew that were so much better than I was. I mean, I, I'm one of those. I'm a portrait of grace. Because if ever God should have squashed somebody like a bug, that was me. And I found myself early on wondering, why is it that some are saved and some are lost? Some come and some go. If you ever found yourself in that place, my promise to you today is that you may not like what you hear. 
You may not accept what you hear, but you will hear the truth from God's word that will explain to you why it is that some are and some aren't. To get a portrait biblically of the saints and the ain'ts. Now, to do that, we're going to go into the next verse. Our text for today is Acts 28, verse 24, and that's it. Just that one verse. As we unpack it, let me tell you the big idea, the timeless truth for today. You, friend, Christian or non-Christian, you need to personally understand the divine dynamics that are involved in eternal investing. You need, you personally, eternally need to understand the divine dynamics that are involved in eternal investing. That's both vertically and horizontally. And to that end, here's my goal for today. My personal goal as pastor and preacher, no matter where you are right now, my goal is that after today, you will not only personally and theologically understand Acts 28 verse 24, but that you personally will understand the salvation process. That you will understand how a soul goes from lost to found. Perhaps more importantly, that you'll understand your role as an investor in this process. That you will be like Christ, that you will be like Paul, that you will be like the giants of the faith. That you will be a biblical Christian who, as an investment, right, because you have received the investment of God. He poured out his life for you, Christian. That if that has happened, then you now have become an investor per the one who owns you. He said, I bought you with a price to send you with a purpose. That you will be my witnesses. You will be my hands and my feet. So let's take a look at what it is to invest eternally. We'll begin by the verse itself. Again, one verse. Paul, let me remind you, has come to Rome. He's been met very quickly by the religious leaders. And he's invited them to come. They came and they said to him, you know what? Let's set up a date where we can come and have you invest in us and pour in. We want to hear what you have to say. And we find ourselves now in verse 24 with those coming that are now getting ready to be invested in. And God's word says, Acts, 24 of, Acts 28 verse 24. Some were persuaded by what was spoken, but others disbelieved. Some were persuaded by what Paul said, but others disbelieved. Some of your translations will say refused to believe, believed not. Here's the bottom line. Paul, one guy, one witness, one stellar example of Christ-likeness has come and poured in to these people. And at the end of the day, God's word, some believed, some disbelieved. So here's my question for you. And if this question rings true in your heart or if you find this to be valuable, you're in the perfect place for Sunday morning. Do you understand why? What's the difference between these folks? Why is it that some were persuaded and believed and others chose not to believe? I suggest to you that understanding the answer to that question, to properly understand what's happening in this verse, is eternally important for you and for those that you may share with. Because if you don't get this and you think you're a Christian, you're probably wrong. Because you can't be a Christian and not understand this. Because you are going to come to Christ by grace through faith. And if your faith is not in the right answer to that question, then you may have sincere faith, but it's misguided. And the quality of your faith is only as good as the object of your faith. And so if you don't understand this question and answer, there's a very good chance that you may have faith in something other than the one true gospel of Jesus Christ. So my prayer is in the next 45 minutes or so that we're going to come to understand exactly what's happening here. Again, God's word. Some were persuaded by what was spoken, but others disbelieved. Well, I've entitled our message this morning, Understanding Eternal Investing. 
understanding eternal investing. And I tell you up front, there are going to be some foundational truths that you're going to need to understand in order to get this. We're going to look at three different categories. We're going to look at the institutions of eternal investing. We're going to look at the instructions for eternal investing. And then we're going to look at the implications from eternal investing. All under the umbrella of this one verse. And I pray that you see this is eternally critical to understand. I thank God for the opportunity to invest this time into these truths that we as people may grow and share this. Now, I think it would be wise to begin with a definition, a working definition of investing. If this is what we're going to focus on and we really want to understand what's happening here in this microcosm, let's begin with a working definition of invest or investing. Now, I've gone to a secular dictionary here. This is not out of my Bible dictionary. And yet, listen for the overtones of the gospel. Listen for the overtones of what it is to be the church. Invest, it's a verb. One, to put to use by purchase or expenditure in something offering potential profitable return. Two, to use, to give, or to devote, such as time, talent, I want to say treasure, they didn't put it in there, as for a purpose or to achieve something. Three, to furnish or infuse with power, authority, or rank. Friend, that's a description of a Christian. That's a secular description of a Christian. Well, this is what we're going to focus on. And again, we're going to look at the institutions, the instructions, and the implications per God's word. So let's jump in and take a look at the institutions of eternal investing. And here, we're going to address the question of what's going on? What's the big idea? What's the design of eternal investing? And I say to you that you've got to take some of these timeless truths, these uncompromisable, non-negotiable truths to heart. And I again recognize that some of what I'm going to share for many within the sound of my voice, they're not going to like it. I can't promise you something that you will like, but I do promise you the truth that will set you free. Amen. And the truth that souls need to hear. So when we talk about what happens with the salvation process or the eternal investing, we're going to need to have first an understanding of what theologians call the doctrine the doctrine of the word of God, then the doctrine of God, then the doctrine of man, and then the doctrine of sin. But let me just bring it down to street language. You need to understand that there's an authority. It's God's word. You need to know the God of the Bible as he tells us about himself and not what we want or think. We need to understand who we really are as human beings and where we fit in the design of things. And then we're going to take a quick look at sin and what the Bible teaches us about that. You cannot understand what happens between God and the church if you do not first and foremost trust God's word. And that's where we start. The doctrine of the word of God. I point you to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And I tell you this, that God has told us that the scriptures are to be our authority. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 tell us that it is here, God breathed, God inspired. Here is the user's manual for life. This is the rule book. This is God's, our great, 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 great loving God's dictionary and diary for his children. This is here. We have to start with the word of God. Otherwise, you're left to other people's open opinions. Know this as well when it comes to the word that Jesus is the word, John 1.1. 1, 1. Jesus is the word of God. So when we talk about trusting the word, we're not just talking about the Bible. We're also talking about Jesus himself. And ultimately, when we talk about understanding the word of God, Romans 10.17 tells us that faith comes by hearing the word of God. So when it comes to the scriptures, if you're going to understand what happens in the salvation process, you must have a healthy, biblical, right understanding of the Bible itself, the word of God. Number two, we need to understand the God of this Bible that we trust. The God who breathed out this Bible. And here we see in, in all of what I will share, an incredible oversimplification but please recognize my purpose today is not to take you into the deep theological truths. We could literally spend a year on each one of these. What I want to do is give you a framework of understanding what happens when somebody comes to Christ. 
so that you'll know whether or not you have and you'll know rightly how to lead others if in fact you have come. So let's take a look at the doctrine of God. And here I want to bring you to Genesis 1 and John 1. We need to see the great creator God. In the beginning, God created. Everything comes back to creator God. Everything begins with creator God. And again, in John 1, 1, Jesus is the creator Christ. See that we not only have the great creator God, but for many of you who are familiar with John 3:16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. We have God the great investor. That when we talk about investing our lives, if you don't see that Christ himself was the investment for your soul, Christian, then you are not likely to embrace the call for you to be an investment into others. Jesus is not only the great creator, he's also the great investor. In John 14, 6 tells us again, in, in lieu of any deep theological study, if you just know that Jesus is creator God, that Jesus is the inv investor God, and in John 14, 6, you see he's the only mediator God. While you will have a very narrow view of God, you'll have enough to understand what happens in the salvation process. Nothing happens without Christ. Everything starts with Christ. Everything comes through Christ. Jesus is God. We sang it earlier this morning. Now, if that's a brief look at the doctrine of the word and the doctrine of God, we also have to have an understanding of the doctrine of man. Who are we? Who is your average human being in the big plan of creation? Well, here I want to again bring you to God's word and I say let's take a look at Genesis 1 and 2. Those of you that are not familiar with your Bible, let me tell you what you'll find. You'll find a portrait and a purpose of man and woman that shows that God created us. We are in the image of God. We are the crown jewel of creation. And you say, yeah, that's us. What you'll also see is that we were made for a loving relationship with this God. He made us with a purpose and that's to be relational with him. He gave us some things to do and the bottom line is, as you'll see momentarily, we messed it up. We broke it, right? To understand who man or woman is, who humanity is in the big scheme of things, it's to look at Genesis 1 and 2 and see the most beautiful portrait of humanity there. To see the intention and the purpose of God. That you have the most incredible potential built into you, friend, and this is to the Christian and the non-Christian alike. The potential in you is beyond your imagination. Because that's how God made you. That's how God made us. We have to have a right understanding. We are not victims of a, of a whirlwind of creation. We're, we're not the happenstance uh, kind of whim of some DNA soup that decided to walk off the beach. No, we are the designed by God with a purpose. Understand our full potential. And then look at Genesis 3 and see where and how we got broken. Where and how this creator God who said, I want to give you the ability to love. In order to do that, I've got to give you the option not to love. You see, if he commanded and made us love, then it wouldn't be love. We'd be robots. But this amazing God who created us said, I want you to have the opportunity to know and share love. The only way you can do that is have the choice not to. And we chose badly. And the truth of the matter is we now have sin in our DNA. And every one of us, we're born sinners. So this is what we understand about man is while we were made with this great potential, we're broken. We're broken from the beginning. If you don't understand this or you don't believe this and you think, well, we're all basically good. And so long as I don't shoot anybody or kill anybody, I'll get to heaven because surely when God gets out his great scales, they'll tip in my favor because I can point to really bad people. Well, you're going to miss out on what's happening and you're not going to understand this dynamic in eternal investing because you're going to start from the wrong place. Lastly, when it comes to man, just as I've bummed you out with the truth of who we are, let me share with you Romans 5, 8, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So as human beings, we have this incredible opportunity, this invitation that has been extended to us, not because we earned it, not because we deserved it, Truth of the matter is, if we had a good look at ourselves, if we had a divine mirror and could look, we would be turned away, our stomachs would turn. And let me just tell you, I'm, I'm the number one example here. I'm a wretch, saved by grace. 
There's nothing in me that is good outside of the work and the presence of Almighty God and His Spirit. That's the truth about us. Now I recognize for some in a context like this, or those within the sound of my voice, you're gonna say, yeah, see, that's why I don't go to church. I don't, I don't want these guys telling me how bad I am. Listen, you are far worse than you could ever imagine. I couldn't possibly tell you how bad you are. You're incredibly worse than you could have ever imagined. That's the truth. The good news is that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. To say to you, come, you'll never make it into heaven with your goodness, but I'll give you mine. You'd never get into heaven with your rubbish, but I'll take your rubbish and I'll give you my righteousness. This is the good news of the gospel. And if by chance I've touched a nerve with any of you, I've, I've had people I love very much who have lost battles over this issue. If you're here today and you say, you know what, you just bum me out. That, I don't want to hear that. Let, let me just point out to you that in this truth, in the, the doctrine of God and the doctrine of man, what we see is that you are worth so much more than you would ever imagine. Now, I just got done telling you you're worse than you could ever imagine, and that's true. And here the other side, the both end. You are worth more than you could ever imagine. In the eyes of God, you are worth more than you could ever imagine. Now, some of you know that my background is in business, so I'm, a, I'm an ex-capitalist, now minister. But let me tell you something that I learned on the streets as a capitalist and as a marketer. If you want to understand the value of something, here's what you do. You don't sit in a room and try to calculate it. You go find out what somebody's willing to pay for it. You want a quick answer to what something is worth? What somebody else is willing to pay is exactly what it's worth, regardless of your opinion. Right? You might think it's worth a million dollars, and if all you'll get is 10 bucks, guess what? It's worth 10 bucks. But if you think that you're broken and that you're not worth anything, and somebody were to come along and say, I'll pay a million dollars for you. Good news, you're worth a million dollars. Well, let me tell you, Jesus paid the ultimate price. He died for you. And Jesus is priceless. So to understand man, you've got to understand that were, we are far worse than we ever thought. And in the eyes of almighty loving God, we are worth more than we could have ever imagined. And I know you say, well, that's kind of friction. Well, welcome to life. And welcome to truth. This is the friction of real living. This is the gospel. Now, if you are a Christian, know this. With that put together, if you're a Christian, you are a priceless investment instrument. You are a priceless investment instrument. God purchased you as an investment to become an investing instrument into others. If we would get this, I tell you what, it would change our lives. At the very least, it would change our priorities. It would have to. We look down at the doctrine of sin next, and I just want to point out to you here that we're all sinners. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we're all under the umbrella of sin. We know that John 8.44 tells us that sin has come from Satan, the father of lies. Sin is nothing more than a collection of, of lies and deceit in the context of real life. And what happens if it goes untreated? Here's what you need to know. Doctrine of God, doctrine of man, doctrine of sin. The wages of sin is death. Do nothing and the default position is to die eternal. Again, I know that's not popular, but that's true. And if somebody says, well, that's kind of harsh. Well, you weren't just listening. Because what I told you about the gospel and what Jesus has done says that while this is true, it's a warning. It's not a whack-a-mole. It's not hit you. It's a warning so that you'll surrender and come to Christ. So this is foundational. This needs to be understood. This is the institution, if you will, of in, uh, eternal investing. Let's take a look at the instructions. And here we address the question of how it all works. Well, what does the Bible tell us? If, if those truths are foundational, what do we do with this? How does it work? And again, I tell you, in order to truly understand eternal spiritual investing, there are some non-negotiables that you must believe and accept. Push them away and you push away the truth. Push this away and you push away the only thing that will help you to truly understand what God is doing. Here again, I share with you three doctrines. The first one is my own. You won't find this under any theologian's study. But I call it the doctrine of the three great C's. You need to understand the instructions that are found in the great commandments, the great commission, and the great conflicts. 
The great commandments is that we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. If you're going to receive his investment, this is what will happen. He will take ownership of your heart. If you're going to invest in others, you must bring that love of God that consumes all else and is selfless for others. The great commission, that you will be willing to go and be his witness. That you will go with the purpose of making disciples, not just going and sprinkling religion on people. And ultimately, that you'll go as Christ came. You say, Pastor Jeff, that's a little much, don't you think? John 20, 21, as the Father has sent me, so now I send you. That's Jesus' words. So these are the instructions that will come associated with the Great Commission. Great conflict, you've been called to a war, Christian. And you and I are going to live in the reality of spiritual warfare. If you don't understand this and prepare for it and live ready, you're going to get beat. That's what's going to happen. You're going to get pummeled. You're going to lose spiritual battles. And sadly, you may find yourself along the side of the road. But if you'll live in the full armor of God, if you'll heed the warning to be shrewd as serpents and gentle and innocent as doves, then you'll be ready for this war. This is what the instructions of the three great C's would say to bring to the investing process. The next piece, it's the doctrine of justification. This is the understanding of the mechanics of what happens and what needs to happen. When you invest in somebody, do you tell them or will you tell them from this point forward, you must be born again. John 3.3, 3, right out of the gate, you must be born again. Will you help people to understand that not everybody who says they are a follower actually are followers? That you have to be very careful because you can be self-deceived. There are those who are intentionally deceiving others. John 6 is a wonderful place to go to see this. There are those that seem to be zealous in following Christ. But what do they want? They want what they want. They don't want him. They want their bellies filled. They want the free stuff. They want the circus act. They want the carnival. Not everybody who says that they are saved are saved. We also see amongst the instructions that Jesus, again, is the only way. And ultimately, if you love him, you will obey him. Now, again, not exactly what you offer people if you're trying to build a crowd. But if you want to understand what happens in the real church, you need to know what's going on. Some of you will recognize this. We've made them available for a number of years. I call it the stick man gospel. At the end of this sermon, if you go to the notes, you'll find this available to you. We make it available on a number of places on the website. Ultimately, it's a portrait of the salvation or justification process. And it will explain to you in detail with all the verses on the back. It will explain to you this process of justification and bring to your attention all that's taking place. And again, I offer it to you as a, a light for your path. I offer it to you as a mirror and a litmus test. I offer it to you as a tool to help others. And I ask you, if you would, please, just invest the time necessary that you would be a better investor in others by knowing this truth or these truths. Now, at the end of our time together today, that image and that story will be shared. I'm going to close our time with praise and worship songs that are designed to continue the sermon. And so when we close today, I ask you to stay and watch the video that was made a few years ago as we went through the book of Romans that will bring you in part through that diagram to understand what's happening in this process. Now, I come in terms of instruction to what is probably the most difficult place for many of us to go. I can tell you this, even if you find this to be easy to swallow, over time, history has found that what I'm about to share is one of the most controversial and one of the most disruptive truths in all the Bible. But if you're going to understand what happens in salvation, if you're going to understand eternal investing, you must embrace the doctrine of election. Now, what's that mean? That's fancy language. That's church language for God has chosen some that are his children from before time began. And you and I have got to embrace the fact that we've got a God who not only breathed creation into being, but chose his children. Now, for many, that's going to create some trouble. It creates friction. Right? So here's what I like to do when the truth creates friction. 
I like to go to God's word. So let me just read to you what God's word says. And I say to you this, if you find this hard, surrender to victory. That where you and God's word disagree, you lose every time. Where I and God's word disagree, I lose. Come to the place where you surrender to the authority of God's word and he and it will set you free. God's word in understanding that God is the source of all grace and all salvation. I begin in the Old Testament in Jeremiah 1 verse 5. God speaks to Jeremiah and says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. New Testament, John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Jesus speaking. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should, be, should abide. Acts 13, 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Romans 8, 33. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Ephesians 1, 4. Perhaps the most beautiful portrait in all the New Testament of God's saving, sovereign grace. One verse. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Let me repeat that. It should set you free. Amen. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and blameless before him. Now, some would say, well, see, that's why I don't do anything. The, the old frozen chosen. See, God's got a plan. I don't have to do anything. I'm just going to sit on my hands. No, 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 no. You see, God never took any hostages into heaven. Nobody gets dragged against their will. There is a both and at play in this eternal investing process. And you've got to get this. Listen, read Romans 9 and then Romans 10. Romans 9 is an incredible portrait of God's saving grace. And Romans 10 brings us to the point of understanding that we must do our part, right? Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. If you then, and we just read where God is doing all of this before time began. You say, Pastor Jeff, what do I do with this? You believe it and you understand that you have two independent truths that yours and my mind cannot bring together totally. Aren't you glad that you serve a God that's bigger than what would fit in your mind? I don't know about you, maybe your head is bigger than mine, but I'm sure glad that the God I serve does not fit in my head. He'd be, he'd be a troublesome God if he did. These are two truths that we can't always bring together, but they are true because God says so. Listen to John 1, verses 12 and 13 to see this combination come together. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. To all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Friends, it's the both and. And for some... Perhaps now you're seeing why we as a church and why the biblical church is so committed to discipling. You see, we have been created to go out as investors. Those who have been saved by grace, we've been called to go out and find the lost and invest as best we can into them. And then to help to grow the found that they in turn would become future investors who would go out and help find the lost and then build them so that they would become discipled warriors who then in turn would go out and help find the lost. This is what you and I have seen on the global stage over the last 2,000 years. This is how Jesus said he would build his church. And make no mistake, that's what he said, I will build my church, right? This is God at work in us. For some of you, you've seen this before, but I want to show it to you again. I pray now under this new light, you'll understand what the dynamic and the purpose and the passions of the church, at least this church, are and why they are. Watch this and see how God has designed his church to grow 
as investors invest in others who will invest in others who will invest in others.
I was going to say it gets silent at the end on purpose, except for the cell phone. But that's Isaiah 6, 8 at the end that says, who will go for us? I say, here am I, Lord, send me. My prayer is that you'll understand that you've been called to be an investor. We've seen the infrastructure in the institution of eternal investing. We've seen a brief portrait of the instructions. Let me just close our time this morning with the implications. The so what factor. That which addresses the question of what comes next. And let me just say to you again, I can't promise you that you'll like this. All I can do is tell you it's the truth. And that Christ died that you would have this truth. Let's start off by looking again at the reality that is there are some non-negotiables that you cannot wiggle away from. There are key elements of the truth that must be embraced if you're going to hold to the truth by definition. So first of all, let's come to the big one. We just addressed the issue of and the truth of the doctrine of election. You've got to come to grips with the fact that some are going to come and some are going to go. You say, Pastor Jeff, you, you know, your grasp of the obvious is incredible. Yeah, I knew that coming in. Well, it's not always so obvious. You and I have got to come to understand that part of the truth and the implication of salvation and God's sovereign grace is that some will say yes and some will say no. I point you to Romans 1 where you'll see a hardening of hearts, the parable of the soils, the parable of the prodigal. All throughout scripture, you are going to see that some say yes and some say no to God. Yours and my place is not to understand necessarily the particulars. It's just to know the reality that you can do everything that you possibly can do and some are going to still stiff arm the Lord and the gospel. You've got to come to grips with this truth that if you think about those that have demonstrated incredible opportunities to believe, I think of Pharaoh, if you know the Old Testament, Pharaoh saw God do the most amazing work ever and still decided not to believe. And yet we know from the scriptures that that was a part of God's plan. And yet at no time was he made not to believe, he chose not to believe. Let me make that point even further and clearer and sadder by saying, what's a sadder portrait of unbelief than Pharaoh? How about the Israelites who were set free from Pharaoh, who walked across the dry bed of the Red Sea, who then chose to disbelieve in the God that set them free and spent 40 years in the desert till they died? Right? The ones who received the amazing grace of God, I think, are a bigger, worse portrait of unbelief than the one that most people would point to. And I say to you, look at the cultural church. That which seems to celebrate all of what God has done and yet denies his presence and his power and his purposes every single day when they make it about themselves. The church is the place where God is given glory, where his people make it all about him. I say to you, I, I think of uh, 2 Corinthians 2, 15 and 16. Perhaps again, the greatest example, biblical truth. It's black and white, literally. You and I, Christian, have been told that we are going to be the aroma of Christ. And to some, we are going to smell like life. And to some, we are going to smell like death. Our place is to make sure that we smell like Jesus. What they do with him is not of our role or responsibility. So we've got to come to grips with the fact that some will say yes and some will say no. Now let's take a look at the bad investments. You say, well, I've poured my life into so-and-so and look, I got nothing, right? It's like Demas. Paul would tell you about Demas. I poured in. I thought he was a brother. I thought things were great. Turns out he loves the world more than the Lord and he's sold out and he's jumped ship. All I can tell you when it comes to your bad investments, friends, is keep investing. Pray and obey. I think of the old adage with Babe Ruth. They said he used to strike out a lot. But if you look at the statistics, I think it was every seven times at bat he hit a home run. So when he would come back and strike out and they'd say, hey, you struck out, big boy. He said, yeah, one step closer to my next home run. Right? That you and I as children of God, it doesn't mean that we minimize those that are not bearing fruit or those that are seemingly uh, a waste of our time. We recognize that we don't have the eyes to see what's happening inside somebody's heart. We just keep investing. Uh, when I was ordained, the man that ordained me said, prayed over me, may Jeff become a double-fisted seed sower who grows comfortable behind the plow. I've never forgotten that. 
This is the essence of what we do with bad investments. We continue to be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. Ultimately, we remember that we too were once bad investments. Right? If you read Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 5, you'll see biblically we're reminded, hey, listen, you used to be one of them. Don't you dare lose your empathy. Don't you forget where you came from. As ambassadors of grace, we are empathizers with the needs of others. What would you say to those that would bring up how unfair this is? If, if what you're telling me is that God is ultimately sovereign and while he may give me faith and he may give me repentance and he may give me that which I need to give back to him, ultimately I don't think it's fair because it sounds to me like if I believe in a sovereign God, then I believe in a God who ultimately knew and was at the core of the selection process. Well, I would bring you back to the doctrine of God and the doctrine of man. That's why we started there. Don't ever think for a second that we look God eye to eye and that we are somehow peers. I remind you of what he told Job when Job got a little upset. The Lord looked at him and said, where were you when I hung the stars in the sky? <laughs> a little calibration conversation, if you will. I say to you, don't ever think that God somehow has to answer to you and me. Now with that said, I also point you to the incredible love that is demonstrated in the fact that God is not fair. Because let me tell you, friend, the last thing in the world you and I want is a fair God. Because if he were fair, we'd be in the midst of hell for what we've already done. Amen. Right? If you think that he's unfair or if you hear others say so, I point you and I encourage you to point them to his amazing grace and mercy. Right? The mercy that doesn't give us what we do deserve and the grace that gives us what we don't deserve. He died that you and I wouldn't have to. He says, I'll take your rubbish and I'll give you my righteousness. It's a gift. It's an incredible truth. And I, I, just, want to, I just want to say to you, I had intended to share another song and I'm not going to do it. But one that points to how incredible God's grace is. If you see it. And that's what today is about. Helping you to see what's happening in this dynamic where souls are saved. You know, I want to intentionally leave you with some, some practical helps, some do's and don'ts when it comes to investing eternally into others. Number one, in the do's category, recognize that your presence is important. It begins with selfless support of others. Note that your personality is important, that you're to custom fit who you are to what they need. Don't just come out, well, this is me, take it or leave it. That you and I are to have a purpose to recognize and to remember it's all about the glory of God when we invest in others. That the investing, it is built on the proclamation of the gospel. If you and I build the best people that we can with our best stuff, they're useless. It's all through the gospel to bring the promise of both the privilege and the responsibility of being a child of God. To bring the passion that shows a Christ-like urgency to all that you do. To bring the power of God, show the people God at work in and through you, that you're not inviting them to you, you're inviting them to Christ. To bring the purity of true motivations, Christ-like motivation. To bring the persistence that shows a commitment to the mission and a perseverance that says no matter what that you literally would look like the eagle that I like to use so often and have this look like you've been through a war, that you, you're going to be persistent and persevere no matter what, and that when you and I show up in heaven one day, we're going to look like that eagle. We're going to look like we've been through a battle. Why? Because we were. Now, let me give you 10 don'ts before we close up. 10 don'ts for eternal investing. Don't give up too easily or give up too early. Don't give in too easily or give up too early. Don't eat your young. Don't, don't get so frustrated with the babes that you, you turn on them. It happens all the time. Don't shoot your wounded. Again, happens in the context of war. This guy's heavy. It's tough to carry him. Don't shoot your wounded. Don't water rocks or fertilize the weeds. Don't invest in that which is dead. And I understand that's hard to understand sometimes, but it's important to recognize. Don't duplicate your mistakes. Learn from your errors. Don't make assumptions. Check everything. I tell you, the assumption problem in the church 
has led to an epidemic. Don't make assumptions, check everything. Don't confuse a resume for a relationship. Doesn't matter what their caliber or their credentials might say to you, look for Christ, right? Next, don't accept actions in lieu of affections. Don't accept actions in lieu of affections. It's always based on the heart. Don't associate death with defeat. Say, so, well, it couldn't possibly have been God there. Look, the guy's dead. It died. Don't associate death with defeat. Some of God's greatest work is seen in their martyrs of the Messiah, right? God's ways are not our ways. And lastly, don't ever forget why you invest. Don't ever forget why you invest. You see, friends, my prayer is that you'll come to recognize that there is an eternal difference between the supernatural Christ followers and the superficial church wallowers. If you don't understand this dynamic that we've looked at today, and if you don't look at it and embrace it biblically, you're suspect. You're suspect in your confidence, and you're likely going to reproduce what is unhealthy. Again, do not confuse the supernatural with the superficial. Do not think that because somebody is in church that they are in Christ. It comes down to the truth of the gospel. Have you been captured by grace and indwelt by his spirit to the point that his investment in you is undeniable and his use of you as an investor in others is your heart's desire? I pray, I pray that the Lord will use this time today to ignite your passions to invite his people that you would invest in their potential no matter what. If you have a heart for this message or if God has spoken to you, I want you in your own time to go back to Ephesians chapter 1. And I want to encourage you to read verses 4 through 13. I shared with you verse 4. It's a 200 word sentence in the original language. A song, really. A 200-word song in one sentence, which is one complete thought that speaks to God's investment in us and his desire for us to be invested in others all through the truth of his sovereign grace that our story would be about his glory and that heaven would be filled and reservations and hell would be canceled in part because we were invested in and then were poured out as investments into others. Would you pray with me? Lord, I thank you so much for this truth and I ask you, Lord, to please use today, use this one verse and all that is unpacked from it to change eternity for countless others, I pray. Lord, let it be, as you said in Isaiah, that one would become a thousand. Lord, let us be those, those divine instruments of investment that you have called us to be, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, I've asked Matthew, if he would, to key up the video that goes with my t-shirt, with the handout. I've called it the stick man or personal gospel. The song itself is of praise, and I ask you to just marinate in God. And if you can, to read what you'll see on the screen. And if not, just let the words of the song speak to your heart. The second one that will follow is called Now I See Christianity. These are two visual video tools that I created specifically designed to help understand what happened today. I pray that they'll not only help you, but they'll equip you to help others as well. If you'd like to pray and want prayer, I'm here and there are other elders as well. Otherwise, just sit and let God speak to you here, I pray. Amen.
wanna see your face as clear as the midnight stars. I wanna feel your love like a train running through my heart. After you, never ever looking back. Make a rule of all. I wanna know you. You are the flame. My heart's on fire. Just like the sun tears through the. Just like the